This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Um, there was a day in time, up until just a couple of years ago, when uh, it was an official state holiday that was recognized by name on the Georgia state calendar, Confederate Memorial Day, and then also Robert E. Lee's birthday um, around January the 19th. Both of them are still legal holidays in Georgia, but uh, we don't have and have not had any governors with enough backbone or spine to call them the official name of those holidays for a number of years, even though they're still legal holidays on the calendar. And uh, so this morning we are observing, commemorating Confederate Memorial Day. But as I said in my uh, introductory comments this morning during the announcement time, we're not here to preach today about the Confederacy or Confederate history and heritage. I'm going to include some of that this morning in the comments that I'll make. <coughs> but we're here to preach about Jesus. And we're here to preach about the same Jesus that our Confederate ancestors loved and adored and lived for. And I hope that by the time we're finished today that you and I will be challenged to do the same thing that they did and to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 22. T.R., we already recording back there? We are. All right. Thank you. Proverbs, chapter number 22. I'm going to read two verses in just a moment, but I'm going to give you time to turn there. The book of Proverbs, of course, is full of wise sayings. That's what a proverb is. And here in Proverbs, chapter 22, we see some verses that are tied very closely to the Confederacy. In fact, they're, very tie, they're tied very closely to the Confederacy in, in that the very motto of the Confederate States of America was taken indirectly from these verses. <clears throat> so if you would, please stand with me out of respect for God's Word. As I read our text this morning, found in Proverbs chapter 22, beginning in verse 22. I'm going to read two verses. Here's what it says. Rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. Here in verse 22, we're giving a command by God. First of all, you ought not steal from anybody, but God says specifically, rob not the poor. If you're going to rob from somebody, definitely make sure it ain't the poor. That would be the worst of the worst, the lowest of the lowest you could get would be to rob from the poor. He says, rob not the poor because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. Somebody that's already afflicted, already down and out, don't kick them. Don't push them further down. Don't, don't oppress those that are already afflicted, God tells us. But then in verse 23, the Bible tells us that God comes to plead the cause of those that are treated thusly. It says, For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. The seal, the great seal of the Confederacy, you may have noticed it, it's, there's a picture of it in your bulletin this morning. And at the bottom of that great seal of the Confederacy are two words written in Latin. Deo Vendice. Those two words come indirectly from the passage of Scripture that we just read together. The meaning of the words I will relate in just a few moments. But the motto of the Confederacy, Deo Vendice, it's a biblical message. And it's the message I'd like to bring this morning. And the title of my sermon is Deo Vendice. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning. That dear God, while we love and respect the memory of those who are Confederate ancestors, Lord, who hallow the hills and the, the grounds all across Dixie and even outside of Dixie today, and those that are buried out back behind us this morning, Father, we love and respect and cherish 
both their memory and the sacrifice that they made for us. But Lord, more still, we celebrate today the fact that they trusted you with all that they had and all that they were to undertake a sacrifice, Lord, that was unparalleled in American history because of their faith in you. And Lord, because they perhaps didn't win the struggle on the battlefield, but for the fact that they stood for what was right, because of their love for you, because of their deep and abiding faith in you. Lord, we know they've been mis misrepresented, they've been maligned for 150 years, and it's going on today. But dear God, we worship you, the God of our ancestors, and we worship you today in spirit and in truth just as they did in their lives. And we seek to live for you. Help us to be motivated, to be challenged, to do more for you as we observe and remember their sacrifices as well. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake only we ask this. Amen. And you may be seated. I would invite you this morning, if you'd like to, to open up your bulletin and look at that emblem of the great seal of the Confederacy, as I share some comments with you about it this morning, I, I'm going to get to the preaching part of the message in just a little while, but before I do that, we'll, we'll take a few minutes to look at the historical aspects of the Confederacy, the, the great seal of the Confederacy, and, and in a moment, the motto of the Confederacy. But take a moment to look at that image as I give you a few comments about it. This is uh, um, a color version of the Great Seal of the Confederacy. Now, the, the Great Seal of the Confederacy is just like the Great Seal of these United States or the Great Seal of any other country or corporation. The Great Seal is actually intended to be an embossing seal that you would imprint into legal documents that shows that this is an official document of whatever government, whatever business, whatever person or entity it's representing. You've all gone and had to have something notarized. And I know a lot of the notary stamps now, they, they're not embossing seals. It's just kind of a black uh, ink stamp they put on things nowadays. But when I was growing up, you had to have an actual embossing seal that would cause bumps to raise up on the paper. That's what the great seal of the Confederacy was intended to, to be an actual embossing seal that would be used by the, uh, the Secretary of State of the Confederacy to show that it was an official government document. By the way, you may or may not know this, depending on how much you are into history, but the Secretary of, the Secretary of State for the Confederacy uh, showed that the Confederacy was way beyond its time in terms of... Uh, uh, forward thinking in some respects. The Secretary of State of the Confederacy was none other than Judah P. Benjamin. You say, preacher, what, what's important or significant about Judah P. Benjamin? Well, his first name might give you a little bit of a hint. Judah P. Benjamin was named Judah because he was a Jew. Uh, he was one of the highest officials in the Confederate government, and he was a Jew. He was the Secretary of State at the time uh, that this important creation was undertaken, the great seal of the Confederacy. They uh, adopted this particular image that you see there as the official uh, great seal of the Confederacy on the 30th of April, 1863. So right in the middle of the war, that's when the Confederate Congress adopted this, this design as our official great seal. Before that, there was no official great seal of the Confederacy. It was to be used for official business by the Secretary of State and his office. The, the original great seal with the embossing stamp was to be manufactured in London, England. And in 1864, that's where it was created. The original was actually created in pure silver. And both the original... And those that were copies of it that were actually to be put into use by the Secretary of State's office, which were not made of silver, they were all shipped from London, England, over here to the Confederacy. 
But you probably remember from history, President Lincoln had the entire South blockaded by sea, and they were trying to keep anything and everything from getting in or out of the Confederacy by ship. So it was going to be difficult to get it here. So as it were, they split up the workable, everyday use embossing seals with the Confederacy and the original priceless pure silver. They separated them, put them on two separate ships. And they shipped them first down to Bermuda. Bermuda was owned by England at the time. And it was kind of a safe haven, a safe passage to at least get, get it that far across the Atlantic. And then they had to try to make it past uh, the blockade to get it over here to, to the south. So they had them on two separate ships to make sure that if one didn't get through, hopefully the other would get through. And they appointed blockade runners to try to get them through to Dixie. Well, the workable, everyday uh, embossing seals that had been made by the same manufacturer, they were, they were able to get through the blockade, and they ended up where they were supposed to end up in Richmond, Virginia. But the original, the priceless one, the one made out of pure silver, they weren't able to get it through the blockade. So it ended up staying in Bermuda, and to the best of my knowledge, from what I could discover, it's still there on display in Bermuda today, the great seal of the Confederacy. It never made it here. But I want to talk about the design of the great seal for just a minute. If you look at it, it's actually a very ornate, beautiful design, and there's a reason for the different elements that are built into it. First of all, across the top there, you'll see it says the Confederate States of America. Then it has the date, 22 February, 1862. The significance of that date, of course, is that that is the date on which President Jefferson Davis was inaugurated as the first president of the Confederacy. And I know every time I say he was the first president of the Confederacy, I always have people say, well, I thought he was the only president of the Confederacy. And I usually just remind my Yankee friends, Brother Mike, I have a few of them, not a lot. I just remind them that he was the first president, but we're not going to concede that he was the last. Uh, we'll leave that open for dispute and debate going into the future. But he was the first president of the Confederacy. He was inaugurated on February 22nd, 1862, and that just happens to be also George Washington's birthday. You say, well, why would they use George Washington's birthday? He's the father of America, the father of these United States. Well, our Confederate ancestors, they recognize George Washington as one of our heroes too because even though you won't hear much said about it, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, they were all Southerners. They were all Virginians. And so they were Southerners. And so the Confederate States recognized George Washington as, as the father of our country too. And they, they cherished his memory, his Christian ideals, and his leadership in giving birth to the American Republic. So that's why the date is on there. In the middle of the Great Seal, the most iconic element, of course, is the equestrian statue of George Washington. This is an emblem, a picture of the actual equestrian statue of George Washington that even at that time was there on, uh, in Richmond, Virginia on Capitol Square. Now, with everything that's gone on with Black Lives Matter and those movements over the last couple of years, I couldn't tell you if it's still there where it's supposed to be or if it's been uh, disfigured in some way, but that's where it was in 1862. It's where it was in 1863 when the Great Seal was adopted. And when I was a boy growing up, that's still where it was. Hopefully it's still there this morning. But that's the center of the Great Seal. Around George Washington's statue, you see a wreath made up of a number of different agricultural products. And that's because the South has and was an ag agricultural community, an agricultural culture if you would. And that's a message all in itself because there are values that are inherent to people that live close to the soil. I think some of our folks that are here today would bear 
record that folks that live close to the soil and depend on the soil, there's a different lifestyle and a different culture and a whole set of values that are different than people that live in big cities and don't go anywhere else. But these, this wreath that's made of these agricultural products, you can maybe try to pick out what some of the products are. There's, there's corn, there's wheat, there's cotton, there's tobacco, there's rice, and there's sugar cane. All there in those, that wreath around the edge of the Great Seal, signifying some of the major agricultural crops of the South. But then that brings us to the last major element of the Great Seal. And it's the motto of the Confederacy that's at the bottom of the seal. Deo Vindice. It, of course, is a Latin term. And it means God will vindicate. You know what vindicate means. Vindicate means to not only plead someone's cause, but to show that the cause was right. That's what vindicate means. If you're vindicated, it means it is proven, it is demonstrated that whatever your cause was, you were right in that cause. The motto Deo Vindice was chosen, adopted by Congress that same day that Jefferson Davis was inaugurated as our first president. February 22nd, 1862. One of the Confederate senators who promoted the adoption of Deo Vindice as the motto for the Confederacy was Mr. Uh, Thomas Sims from Louisiana. Now, you may not have heard of Thomas Sims before this morning, but if you're big on Confederate history, uh, Brother Kevin, Brother Mike, you might be more familiar with his first cousin, Raphael Sims, who was an admiral in the Confederate States Navy, and he was the captain of the CSS Alabama, the greatest Confederate warship of the entire war. This is his cousin, Senator Thomas Sims. He proposed and stressed Deo Vindice as the motto for the Confederacy, and he specifically said over and over that he wanted the motto of the Confederacy to demonstrate our firm reliance upon God. And he even, he even pointed out the fact that the U.S. motto, E Pluribus Unum, says nothing about God. And that the U.S. Constitution really doesn't say that much about God either. He said, we as a people are firmly relying upon God. And our motto ought to show that. Our Constitution ought to read that. Everyone on the face of the earth for the rest of time ought to know that we are a people that fear God and rely upon Him. So Deo Vindice won the day. It was adopted as the motto of the Confederacy. I thought about that term, Deo Vindice, in relation to the, the verses we read this morning. I'm going to read verse 23 again. It says, For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. The Lord will plead their cause. You know, if there's any group of people in all of American history that have been maligned, misrepresented, and had ugly things said about them erroneously more than any other group of people... It is that five men that are buried out back here at Midway Methodist Church, Pinnacle Baptist Church, in the cemetery today. And they're fellow Confederate veterans that hallow our hills all across Dixie. They've been misrepresented as to who they are, for what they stood, why they fought. And why so many of them died. It is left to you and I to tell the truth of those men that are buried out back. And the cause for which they stood. For it is not at all the cause that has been represented by New York, Hollywood, and Washington. And to us, their grandsons and their granddaughters. We of all people ought to say unashamedly, that's not who they were. That's not for what they stood. 
And we will tell the truth. Because if anything is borne out by all that we see in the world today, it is this one thing. Deo vindice. God will vindicate. Because what we see today, all around us, because they lost on the battlefield, we see more clearly than ever the vindication of their cause. For everything they said would come to pass if they lost or didn't take their stand is what has come to pass today for all Americans, not just Southerners. So, what was the cause? President Jefferson Davis said at the beginning of the war, all we wish is to be left alone. Who could, who could argue with that? I mean, after all, these United States for the last 50 years have pushed for the ideal of self-determination, self-government for every other country around the world. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, and a dozen other countries around the world that these United States have stood up and adamantly argued that it is the right of every people to have self-determination, self-government, to choose their own path. Isn't that why we're sending somewhere around $6 billion so far of supplies to the Ukraine in their current struggle? And that's all the South asked for was to be left alone, to have self-determination and self-government. The southern states seceded from these United States in 1860 and 1861, the exact same way that the colonies seceded from Great Britain in 1776. And they tried to do it the same way that the colonies tried to do it in 1776, peacefully by just parting company, and going our separate ways. By the way, that's what the Bible commands us to do. If we disagree with somebody, we're not to fight it out, argue, and create a big ruckus. We're just to peacefully separate and go our separate ways. That's what the Bible tells a Christian to do. That's what the South attempted to do. All we wish is to be left alone, Jefferson Davis said. But you know that's not what's said. We're told over and over, and our kids are bombarded with it every day at school, in the media, in culture in general. The South and those evil Southerners, they left the Union and fought against the Union because they wanted to perpetuate slavery. I thought I'd share some things this morning that might surprise you if you don't already know them. Did you know that when the Confederate States Constitution was adopted there in 1862, actually 1861, the Confederate Constitution was the first constitution on this continent to outlaw the foreign slave trade. No more slaves could be brought into this continent through the Confederacy. Did you know that it was the Confederacy that outlawed the slave trade before those hypocrites in New England did it in the United States. Probably didn't know that. You probably weren't told that in school. You probably didn't read that in a textbook. And I'm sure you didn't see it portrayed in any Hollywood production. The Confederacy outlawed the slave trade before the United States did. I bet you also didn't know that before most of the southern states left the Union that there was a proposed 13th Amendment to the Constitution that would forever prohibit the federal government from interfering with slavery in, the, in all the states. Basically, the northern states were saying to the southern states, if you'll stay in the Union, we'll pass this 13th Amendment that says the federal government can never touch the subject of slavery. You can keep your slaves if you want to, if you'll stay in the Union. President Lincoln even supported the adoption of that 13th Amendment. 
Now, it's not the 13th Amendment that ended up being passed later on after the war. It was called the Crittenden Amendment. And I bet you never heard of that either. The southern states were told, you can keep your slaves forever if you want to, if you'll just stay in the Union. Bet you never knew that. But the southern states didn't choose to stay in the Union. Even though they could have stayed in and kept their slaves if they wanted to. So was it really over the issue of slavery? I think not. Any rational, logical person who knows the truth and knows the facts, no, that's not what it was about. Or they could have just stayed in the Union and kept their slaves. Right up to today if they had chosen. No, they left for some higher ideals. They left because, number one, they were already being outnumbered and outvoted in both the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. And the North basically had enough numbers that they could vote for themselves whatever they wanted. Again, you may not know this, but in 1860, the South was paying 90% of all taxes to the federal government. Bet you didn't know that. Bet you weren't told that. But can you imagine that? Mine and your grandfathers and grandmothers were paying 90% of the federal taxes in America. Below the Mason-Dixon line. Meanwhile, the, the money that was going into the federal government from the South was all being used on projects up north. Internal improvements. Roads. Railroads. Canals. Do you want to know why the North had almost ten times as much rail lines up north when the war broke out as we had in the South? It's because our money from our ancestors was taken from them, put into the federal government's coffers, and then spent on railroads up north. I don't know what you call that. I call that regional communism, taking from this person to give to that person uh, who didn't deserve it, didn't need it, and had more already. To me, that sounds a whole lot like what the Bible says. Rob not the poor because he is poor. Taking from those that don't have as much and giving it to those that already have more, to me that sounds a whole lot like Proverbs 22, 22. That's why our ancestors left. They followed what the Constitution said in the Tenth Amendment. States' rights, state sovereignty. You see, they had a biblical view of government that was bequeathed to them by the Founding Fathers of 1776, by the Patrick Henrys and the George Washingtons, the Thomas Jeffersons and the James Madisons. They believed in the same principles of government. You want to know where they got those principles? From this book. You see, they believed that all authority emanates from God. All lawful authority. The Bible teaches that God is the Creator. If you've seen me or heard me give this short presentation, forgive me, humor me, there, there are some who haven't. God is the Creator. He made everything there is, including man. When He created man and placed him in the Garden of Eden, He gave man some, but not all, of His sovereignty. Sovereignty is supreme authority. He gave man some, but not all, of His authority. God still has all authority, but He gave man some of it to be His representative here on earth, to be stewards of the rest of creation. He told man in the Garden of Eden to have dominion over it, to name the animals, to dress and keep the garden. He gave man certain responsibilities, but He gave him the authority to do those things. Man doesn't have all the authority that God has. We're not the Creator. But we have the authority that God chose to give us as individual men and women. In our American system, our founding fathers in 1776 came together and they chose for, for individuals to voluntarily compact together, covenant together to create the states. They started out as the colonies, but they're the states today. And individual men and women gave up some, but not all of their authority, their sovereignty, to create the states. 
the states are not supposed to have as much authority over your life as you have over your life. I know that's a big shock compared to the way it's done today. But God has all authority. Individual men and women have more authority than what's under them. And then comes the states. The states are only supposed to have the authority to do and to regulate what we've given the state to do. Nothing else. If it tries to take a power and authority away from the individuals that wasn't given to it, that's called usurping authority. And it's unlawful. In the American system, though, we then allowed the states to voluntarily create the federal government. That's what happened with the ratification of the Constitution of these United States in 1788 and 1789. The federal government was created by the states, which were created by the individual men and women. And just like the state doesn't have as much authority as the individuals, the federal government's not supposed to have as much authority as the states who created it. In fact, the federal government is and was created as the agent of the states, the employee of the states, to work for the states. Nowadays, though, you'd you think it's the other way around. The states kind of do the bidding of the federal government. That's not the way our founding fathers set it up. And the federal government's only supposed to have the sovereignty to do those things that were given to it, delegated to it, in Article One. Section 7 of the Constitution by the states. All the other powers that the states had were to be retained by the states who had more power than the federal government. But the states didn't have as much power as individuals and we don't have as much authority and sovereignty as God who's God, the Creator. Our, our Confederate ancestors believed in this concept of government. Because it comes from the pages of this book. They believed that God was to be at the center of every area of life, including politics. My, what a refreshing thing that would be if Washington acknowledged God's to be in the center of everything, including politics. And our Confederate ancestors understood that what was going on already in 1860 was a usurpation of the God-given rights that God had bequeathed to us and that our founding fathers in 1776 had shed their blood to guarantee for us. That's why they chose to part company peacefully, to go their own separate way, to stand upon the principles of this book. Not for their sake, but for my sake. And for your sake. For all their children and all their grandchildren who would be born afterward. To not grow up to live under tyranny. But under freedom and liberty. The same thing that our ancestors did in 1776. There was no difference in the cause. You say, well preacher. That, that's not what's presented. I know that's not what's presented. But it's the truth. Those Confederate veterans that are buried out back here, I'll guarantee you that's why they went and fought. Approximately 90% of all Confederate soldiers never even owned one slave. Bet you didn't know that either. Can you imagine 90% of Southern men going and risking their lives, and in many cases giving their lives, so that a handful of people over there could keep their slaves? No. No. That doesn't even make sense. That's not the reason for which they fought, they bled, and they died. They died for the cause of liberty, and they died because they had an unvearing belief that God is to be at the center of everything. It's why they chose the motto that they chose. Deo vindice. God will vindicate. And then you have to say, well, preacher, it doesn't look like God vindicated. 
They lost on the battlefield. They lost. That's why we're not the Confederate States of America today. Whether you want it to be so or don't want it to be so, it's irrelevant. We're not that because they lost on the battlefield. At the end of the war, Jefferson Davis made another famous statement. He said, the principle for which we contend is bound to reassert itself. Though it be at another time and in a different form. What he was saying is the cause of the South is a right cause. And you can beat it down, you can grind it into the ground, but right is always right. Truth is always truth. And right will always rise again in some form or fashion, even at a different time. Look around you today. Why is America in the condition she's in? I would submit to you that it's because of what Proverbs twenty two twenty three 23 says. God said, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. Our ancestors were ground into the dust. Not just during the years of the war, but during the ravages of reconstruction on civilians after the war. It wasn't just your great-great-grandfathers who gave their all. It was your great-great-grandmothers too. White and black alike. The South was decimated during the war and for 20 years after the war, during Reconstruction. Everything they had was taken. They could, in most cases, barely even feed themselves, and many did not, and starved. Today, what we see around us is the vindication of our ancestors and that their cause was a right cause. They said if we don't take this stand, there will be an absolute, out-of-control, tyrannical federal government that will have its hand in every area of your lives. My, that sounds like I just picked up the the newspaper, and read the headlines of today. Did you know that about 90% of what the federal government has its hands in in your life today are unconstitutional? You say, how do you know that, preacher? Well, Article 1, Section 7 of the Constitution lists all the powers granted to the federal government, and it's a list about that long. That means every other thing they have their hands in in your life and in your pocketbook is unconstitutional. And the very few things they are supposed to do, about 10%, they don't do. Guarding your borders, securing your safety from foreigners pouring over the border. The things they're supposed to do, they don't do. Everything else they do, they're not supposed to do. You see, everything our Confederate ancestors said would be true if they didn't take a stand is exactly what has come true today. It's what they were trying to stop. For you. Not for them. They gave their lives. For you. For me. For our children. Think about the other problems going on in the world today, in America today, that are caused by the federal government sticking its nose into the business of the states where it has no authority to do so. All because the Confederates who believed in state sovereignty, they lost on the battlefield, but their cause was right. I think about the subject of marriage. The right of the states to say marriage is between one man, one woman, and God. The federal government has said, even though the states believe that, you can't do it. What about abortion on demand? The murder of unborn children in the womb. There's no southern state in favor of abortion. But it's gone gone on now for nearly 50 years. What about the attacks on your right to keep and bear arms? Which, by the way, is not a right you're given by the Constitution. It was given to you by God. It's just acknowledged by the Constitution. 
But now the federal government's trying to attack that as well. What about the Ten Commandments? Oh, you can't post the Ten Commandments in a courthouse. God forbid someone would read them and follow them. Especially in a courthouse. You'd think that's where they would belong the most. Nope, can't have them there. Ask Chief Justice Roy more about that. The federal government is involved in our elections when it's not supposed to. They don't even want the state of Georgia to be able to verify that who's voting is actually who's supposed to be voting. You might be causing somebody some heartache. Yeah, because they shouldn't be voting. What about businesses? Governor Lester Maddox closed his restaurant and ran for governor because the federal government wanted to tell him who who he could hire and couldn't hire, who he could allow his customers and couldn't allow his customers in his restaurant. Then he invested his own money, his own time, and his own sweat and tears to build. Why? Because the government thinks they have the right to tell you how to run your business if you own a business. What about education? It's no more about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's about social engineering. We've got to make sure that today's children come out of school with a different set of values than what mom and daddy's trying to teach at home, than what grandma and grandpa are trying to inculcate upon them at home. They've been dumbed down. They've removed our history and our heritage and our heroes. It's all, it all proves that our ancestors who were buried out back, who gave their all, were exactly right. That if they lost, their worst nightmare would be what you and I live in today. Federal tyranny. Away from this book and away from God. In case you don't already know it, Washington, D.C. is against God. Completely and totally. But think about the example of our Confederate ancestors, both our grandfathers and our grandmothers. If you, if you haven't stayed with me, come back to me for a minute. Think about the odds they faced, and yet they still took a stand, knowing the odds were against them. Think about the sacrifices that they made. We have all the comforts that we have today. They had none of those. And the few they had, they lost. Think about the example that they said. Losing everything, but standing for God. For this book and the principles in this book. They were men and women of faith. There was a book written in 1877 after the war was over about the great revival in the southern armies. There was a revival that literally swept through all the southern armies, starting in the Army of Northern Virginia in 1863, during the middle of the war. The book was written by William Wallace Bennett. It's a good name, William Wallace Bennett. He was a Methodist preacher, by the way. And he wrote and chronicled the the thousands and thousands of Confederate men in the army who got saved in camp meetings going on in the army in 1863 during the war. He estimates that approximately 150,000 southern men came to know Jesus as their savior during the great revival of the southern armies. It undoubtedly was because of so many men coming to Christ, southern men, that they were able to endure losing the war and endure the harshness and the ravages of Reconstruction for the next 20 years. They became godly men. After the war was over, the South was no longer known as the Confederacy. Instead, it began to be known as the Bible Belt. Ironically, the Bible Belt. And I know I haven't heard it called that other than by me in more than a few years, But as a boy growing up, I heard that term frequently, didn't you? This is the Bible Belt. We live in the Bible Belt. 
It's because of the revival that took place in the middle of the war that had a profound and lasting effect for generations to this very one. You see, all of this explains why America is where she is today. And this ought to be a call for the sons and daughters of the South, whether natural born or adopted, to once again accept the call to be men and women of faith. We're called to be men and women of faith. We not only do God an injustice, we do our ancestors an injustice too, to be anything less than men and women of faith. At this time, I'm going to read the names of five men that are buried out back. The first four I know of a fact are Confederate veterans. The fifth one I do not know, but his age fits the time period where he could have been. I do not know if he was or not, but we're going to give him honorable mention just in case. We're not going to leave him out. Drury... Whitfield Rogers, Corporal of Company G, the 63rd Georgia Infantry. M. Chapel Bowles, Company I, the 30th Georgia Infantry. If you're from Henry County, you may have some ancestors in that outfit. B. F. Weldon, Colonel uh, Company C, 13th Georgia Infantry. W. H. Slade, Company H, 44th Georgia Infantry, and Company G of the 27th Georgia Infantry, Zachary's Rangers, out of McDonough. And then our fifth man buried out back, who may be a Confederate veteran, is Andrew J. Thomas, born in 1848 and died in 1913. He would have been about 17 to 18 years of age at the end of the war. I do not know if he served in a unit, if he was part of the Georgia Guard, the Home Guard, or if he didn't serve at all. But I strongly suspect he served in some capacity near the end of the war. 